Hello and welcome to another episode of Chasing Excellence. My name is Patrick Cummings. As always, I'm here with Ben Bergeron. Every week on the show, we dedicate some time to exploring how we can live a life of better health and increased fulfillment. We answer your questions about the five factors of health, dive deep on living a life of excellence, and explore the strategies and frameworks to help us chase what truly matters. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Hello and how are you, Ben? Hello and I'm doing well. Thank you, Patrick. It is a beautiful day here, so welcome to spring. Springtime. Springtime in New England is special. I know. I got the I got the windows open in the office. It's it's always nice when we get to get there, to get to that point of the year. Uh, what we've got this episode addressing listener questions about how to manage upper body cardio following an injury and tips for establishing leadership in a gym environment. Uh, for our workout, we're returning to another one of our frameworks, jumping back into what we've referred to in the past as the hierarchy of mindset. I think we're going to change the name of that. We're going to talk about what it is and update some of our thinking around it. And then we will wrap up the episode with a hopper talk question about what we were really into as kids and are excited about this because a lot of the time, because we've been doing this for many, many years, a lot of the times I have a sense of your answers to these questions. I don't know that I have a good sense of what your answer to what you were really into as a kid. So I'm excited to actually learn cool. uh, what you were like as a kid. Uh, just a reminder before we get into the warm up, if you want to get a question into a future episode, head to www.chasingexcellence.email and get on the free newsletter list. Every Friday, we send out a note with a link to a form that you can use to submit as many questions as you've got. The link to that is also in the show notes for easy clickability. Our warm up. We start each episode with your questions about the five factors of health, those few fundamental behaviors that most positively affect our performance, vitality, and longevity. Those five factors are how we eat, how we move, how we think, connect, and recover. Three questions, as always. We've got first one from Adam in the move category. He says, I did CrossFit for about four years, weightlifting for a couple years, and followed by powerlifting for about a year. However, I haven't been active in about a year and a half and gained some excess weight. I have a question. I recently had a freak accident. I slipped on the driveway operating a snowblower after a storm. It wasn't a hard fall, but I didn't land right and fully ruptured my patellar tendon. It's been about two months since the emergency surgery. I'm now able to sit and walk without my leg, uh, without my leg fully extended. Questions not about the tendon recovery, but, but do you know any good upper body cardio ideas? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Heather, just about a year ago, experienced almost the same thing where she yeah. slipped and fell on some mud at a uh, our daughter's lacrosse game down in North Carolina. She was down there with my with that, oh, me, her daughter, and uh, when she looked down, her kneecap was on the side of her leg. Yeah, uh, I remember she, you told me that, and yeah, I had ripped, to put the it, phone down. It ripped so bad that it cracked her kneecap in half. Oh. Um, so full tear of the, not patellar tendon, but... Um, the quad, uh, but it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, to get back to the question, um, it's an, it's kind of an interesting question because, uh, I think what he's getting at is when he says cardio is, can I get a cardio response? Uh, mm -hmm. cause, and I'll give kind of the, I'll give three different maybe buckets of answers. You could do traditional quote cardio stuff like seated, Ski erg, uh, mm -hmm. um, or um, seated rowing. Now it sounds like, whoa, 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 whoa. But we've had plenty of athletes that you put your injured foot in a brace on a skateboard and mm -hmm. it's just going along for the ride while the other foot is doing all of the work. And it actually, you get a total body, not just an upper body on the rower. But you don't need to do cardio to get a cardio response. And here's maybe like a little hybrid between uh, something that's not very common in our space or what we do, but you'll definitely recognize it and see it. It's popular in the fighting community um, is rope battles. You can do seated mm -hmm. rope battles. And the reason we don't do it just to kind of throw that out there is it's really un unmeasurable. Um, people have tried to put a measurement to it in terms of duration, but the intensity is really hard to measure, meaning like the load or distance or anything else. So you do that, but here would be my answer is do body weight moments. Do five strict pull-ups, 10 push-ups, and 15 sit-ups for as many rounds you possibly can in 20 minutes. It's essentially Cindy, the CrossFit girl workout, but you're subbing out sit-ups for the squats. And as long as you're probably a little bit early for this, because the only limitation would be your ability to get up and down. That would be the thing for the sit-ups. If that is a challenge, then 
um, you know, just do bigger sets, honestly. Mm-hmm. So you're not rotating through with as many transitions. But anybody that's done the workout, Cindy knows how cardio quote that is. Um, it's essentially the middle part of Murph, and no one in the middle part of Murph is like not breathing heavy. So. Yep. <laughs> Uh, that would be the suggestion. You could even throw a weight vest on if you want to make it a little bit more challenging. But there's a, it's kind of the three different buckets: traditional cardio, seated, uh, rope battles, seated, or body weight stuff. Mm-hmm. And the goal being, of course, like get the heart rate up, get the the breathing heavier, right? That's, like that, that's, that's what his question. What, that's what his question. That was. tends to be what people so, yeah. think about when they think of cardio, right? Yeah. Yes. So as long yeah. as you're, you're as long as you're doing that, it doesn't have to. To your point. Be a it be a cardio machine. Yeah, cardio is not swim, bike, run. It's right. just that's the triathlon thing. Yep. You can get an incredible, and actually, this is we've talked about this podcast before, but um, you can get a stronger cardiovascular, meaning your your lungs and hearts pumping. You know, basically like your heart pumping blood through your body. Um, response through weightlifting than you can running. And that's just, that's just, that's the, the truth. Like mm. do, uh, um, 50, you know, do grace, do grace versus, uh, the equivalent time versus a 400 meter run and your heart rate will get higher. And you, cause you're using, it's just, it's a more challenging cardiovascular demand. Mm-hmm. All right. Next question is in our think category. It's from Valerie. She says, I'm a 26 year old. Uh, I'm 26 years old and I manage a gym and coach full time. I started at this gym extremely part-time a few years back, two to five hours a week, and have climbed up to basically running the show alongside the owner. As I've stepped into this role and taken on more responsibility, it's Uh, It has been difficult to establish myself as a leader and manage the other members of our team like other part-time coaches. Most of them have been with this gym for much longer than me, some of them even up to 10 years, and I'm the youngest person we have on the staff, so there isn't much quote-unquote built-in authority. All of my friends at my age are coming out of school into their careers but are not quite in leadership positions yet, so I can't relate or bounce bounce thoughts or ideas off of them very often. My question is, what are a few of the best things I can do to become more confident confident in my ability to lead my team as we grow, make changes, et cetera. This is a great question just for the, the level of awareness and, um, you know, that it's a challenge because you're young and you don't have the peer group and you know that there's work to be done. You don't just, you, you don't just by default earn that position. So mm-hmm. there's a lot to like about this question. Um, and it, there's the, the answer basically comes down to two different aspects. The first one is no one's going to anoint you. No one's going to say you are now a leader. You have to just start acting like it. And this is every young sports athlete that's trying to play the role of from you know young buck, young rookie in the league to now the leader. Tom Brady, when he came in after Drew Bledsoe went down his second year in the season, he's taking over for a $100 million quarterback. He's looking around. He's the 23-year-old kid, and there's a bunch of 30-year-olds in, in, the, in the huddle. But when he comes in, he acts, he's, acts like he's the leader. Like that's the, and this is the weird answer. How do you do it? You start acting like the leader. You have to start assuming that position. Now, the challenge of that obviously is how do I do that? Well, there's it's a really simple sort of acronym formula, which is you have to, you have to, you have to care, and that's people when people say care, it's not the empathy thing, it's not the nice thing, it's not hugs, it's not being really nice. It's you have to care. You have to care about the performance of the team. That's what you mm-hmm. have to care about. You have to care about this thing. The next is you have to have competence. You yourself have to be a high performer. So you have to care. You have to be competent yourself. And for us in that world, you have to be a competent coach. So it goes into how to become a competent coach. And that's a whole other discussion. And the last one is you have to be consistent. And it's the hardest part about being a leader. Mm -hmm. You have to do this. You You have to show up every single day putting your needs second. And it's the needs of each individual on your team, the needs of each of the customers or members, and the needs of the team as a whole behind you. And that's really hard. Like being a leader, uh, 
frankly, it sucks in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's an incredibly rewarding position and there's a lot of freedom that comes with it. There's a lot yep. of fulfillment that comes with it. But just like, I mean, you know this, like being a dad, mm-hmm. like being a dad, a lot of the time isn't the awesome part. Now, being a dad is awesome. Like yeah. being a dad. But most of aw- being a dad is not awesome. <laughs> but most of being a dad is not awesome. Like yeah. you have to... You have to change diapers. You have to get up in the middle of the night to like feed a crying baby. You have to deal with a uh, extremely tired spouse. You have to still navigate work. And then like you try and teach and fail and teach and fail. And then all of a sudden, oh, a little victory. And then next thing comes along, you get punched in the face again. If you're a dad, you get punched in the balls again. Like that <laughs> happens all the time. But that's the idea. It's like you have to constantly, constantly, constantly do this thing. So- that's the first part is you have to act like a leader. Now, the next part is a little bit of this, this understanding of where you are in the journey. And this is just borrowed completely from John Maxwell, who wrote a better book than I ever could on it called The Levels of Leadership. And I, I've since, I've, I've talked about this so much that I've since reframed his levels. Uh, so I can't remember what he called them, but I call them, and I think he calls them the same. Level one is positional, which is where you are right now. You mm-hmm. are the boss, but... You have no real authority other than, hey, I'm the boss. You got to do what I say. That's a really crappy place to be. Level two leadership is relationship-based, which is people will listen to you not just because you're the boss, but because they like you. You're the friend. But that's not really going to get them to do the hard things. They're going to go and they're going to you know, replace the toilet paper because you asked them to because you like they like you. But not a whole lot else. No one's going to go above and beyond for a positional leader. Um, so then we need to grow to another level, which is results based, and that's level mm-hmm. three. And that happens mm-hmm. when um, you start to deliver results for members of the team. You know, like in our case, you help someone get uh, there. You help someone study and become a level three. You help one of your teammates get on to uh, the seminar staff. You help someone get to the CrossFit games. You have four people that have lost a hundred pounds. Now you, you open up, you run a business and it's super successful. You open up a second business. When you open that second business, you have the results of the first one to lean on. And people are going to go, I'm going to listen to that guy because he's done this before. Yeah. Level four though, is when you get results for that specific individual. You get, when you get that person to the CrossFit Games, when you get that person on level with seminar staff, when you build the second business with that person, and now they're the gym manager from the intern that started. Now all of a sudden, there's a lot, it's all levels of buy-in. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. When you're positional, there's no buy-in, it's just authority. When they're friends, hey, I trust you, so you wouldn't lie to me. Result is like, hey, they did this for that guy over there. He might know what he's talking about. And then when you do it for that person, it's like, hey, this person's told me these six things. These six things were game changers for me. When they tell me the seventh, I'm going to listen to that. There is a fifth, which is called pinnacle, which is people seek you out because of your reputation. But most of us don't need to worry about that one. Right. It's interesting that the, you know, those two sort of frameworks, the care, competence, consistency, and then the levels of leadership, The third and fourth levels line up perfectly to that competence end of things, right? And so understanding how those two things are related. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. I just think it's... it's, uh, Yeah, you can almost put that framework inside of that comp. That's, yeah. And then the second thing is, and this is something that I've struggled with uh, myself, is recognizing that, especially thinking about the care, but even the competence. And when you turn the corner is when you think more about what they need and what they're lacking mm-hmm. and how you can help them, then you're thinking about what do I need I to become a better leader or to become more successful? Or what do I need to be more competent? Recognizing that that's a, that is a, a hard but necessary shift that we all need to make when, as we're, as you know, to, as Valerie is going from where she is to where she wants to go, that will happen as soon as more of her, of her energy is spent thinking about her coworkers and her members, then she's worried about, am I being a good leader? How can I be a better leader? It's easy to think about, uh, it's easy to think about me and what do I need? What should I do? But the, the secret, the unlock is them. It's like the perfect analogous story to that is 
and show Valerie will relate to this is coaching itself. When you first start coaching, you're so in your own head about how am I going to stay on track with the lesson plan? Am I hitting the points of performance? Um, is what, um, am, am I on the timeline? Like, it's like all these different, like, yes. am I doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing? Am I doing the things? And when all of a sudden, and it's, I don't think it takes the 10,000 hours, but it certainly takes thousands of hours. It starts to shift to that starts to melt away. And you're, what you're doing is just reading athletes. You're just reading them going like, what could they use right now? What do they need right now? And none of the thought goes into timeline, points, performance, or anything else. What do they think of me? Am I doing yeah. a good job? It's a, the that. performer up on stage all the time going like, imagine like a, a musician going like, what's the next note? What's the next line of the word of the song? <laughs> right. um, what's the audience think of me right now? Like, so in my own head, as opposed to get up there and just like feeling the vibes. That's a performer. Like that's, that's just feeding off the crowd. All right. That is a wrap for the warm up. We're going to jump into our workout, all about uh, one of our more prevalent frameworks in just a moment. But first, a few words of thanks from a few sponsors. We're brought to you this week by Element. Let's talk about hydration. We all know it's important, but did you know that staying hydrated isn't just about downing lots of water? It's about balancing that water with electrolytes. That's why we love Element, a zero sugar electrolyte drink mix that's designed to support active hydration in a healthy lifestyle. Head to drinkelement.com slash excellence to learn more and get some for yourself. Element provides just the right balance of sodium, potassium, and magnesium to help you feel and perform your best. And they do it without any sugar, artificial colors, or dodgy ingredients. This means that Element supports your hydration without derailing those healthy habits that you've been building. And it's not just for athletes, it's perfect for anyone wanting to maintain optimal health and performance. Whether you're working out, working a long day, or just dealing with life's everyday stressors, Element has got you covered. Element is tasty, convenient, and trusted by many of the world's leading health experts, athletes, and even Navy SEAL teams. But it's not just for the elite, it's for anyone who wants to support their health and hydration. So if you still haven't given Element a try, let's change that. Go to drinkelement.com slash excellence, that's the letters L-M-N-T, and get a free sample pack with any purchase. Drinkelement.com slash excellence. Give it a try and see how much better proper hydration can make you feel. We're also brought to you this week by Bond Charge. I've got to tell you about something I've been using and loving lately, Bond Charge's infrared sauna blanket. After a long day, nothing beats the relaxation and compression that it offers. It's portable, affordable, and brings all the benefits of a traditional sauna right into your home. Ben, my wife just sent me a, something on Instagram for a sauna that's outside, and I looked it up and it was $14,000, and I told her that I'm going to stick with my sauna blanket happily. Uh, <laughs> Head to bondcharge.com. Use the code excellence to save yourself 15% off everything they've got on their site. The Bondcharge infrared sauna blanket uses infrared light directly heating your body rather than sur the surrounding air. This allows you to reap the benefits at a lower, more comfortable heat and prevents your head from overheating. You can burn up to 600 calories in just one session and sweat out heavy metals and other toxins. The best part, it sets up in under a minute, heats up in just a few minutes, and is easy to clean and store away. To learn more and get yourself one of these bad boys, head to bondcharge.com. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com. Make sure you use the code excellence at checkout. That'll save you 15% off your purchase, plus get you some free shipping as well as a 12-month warranty. Start reaping the benefits of regular convenient sauna use today with Bond Charge. Other cool part about that is if you have a sauna, but you're traveling and you want to bring mm -hmm. the sauna with you, it's like a portable. It's not just yep. like in your home. Um, yep. Yeah, that's all. That's a challenging part. You're like you, you, a lot of times you can't find uh, yeah. a sauna. If you're going you. skiing for the week or something, exactly it just right. packs up in a nice yeah. bag. Yep. Yep. There you go. All right. We are going to dive into our workout uh, as we've been doing about once a month. We're revisiting and updating uh, some of the frameworks that we've talked about here on the show. We've done a conversation on the five factors of health. We've done a few others. We're going to dive in today to one that is maybe like right up there for us with five factors of health. Like if it was, it was that one and this one, I think are really the keystone frameworks uh, from Chasing Excellence. It's something in the past that we've called the hierarchy of mindset. I think we're going to change the name to the, the mindset continuum. But as we get into it, we'll kind of explain why maybe it's better thought of as a continuum than a hierarchy. But I would love for you to just kind of give us the 
we were joking before I told you we're going to do a five minute overview and you're not sure if you can do this in five minutes. So I'm going to challenge you for <laughs> five minutes overview of what, what is this framework? What is the mindset continuum? Uh, and then I've got a handful of questions to kind of dive into. Uh, so let's just first do the quick one, which is why continuum versus hierarchy. And that is that you, it's not like once you level up to this thing, you are now living at a new level. It's a, it's mm-hmm. a, it's, it's their phases and you might experience all five of these different phases in inside of the same minutes and even <laughs> almost in the same side of almost in the same moments sometimes. Um, it, and that's why people that train the way we do, it's so it, it becomes incredibly obvious as to where you are. And that's why you go, Oh my gosh, yes, I can, I can, re- I, I, I can relate to that. It, um, that it resonates a lot with me because before the workout, I thought this and during the workout, I thought that and after the workout, I thought this. Um, so <laughs> yep. those, the different phases that sit inside of this continuum, um, other part of the continuum is it, it very much is like the, the, the sick, well fit continuum. Um, I just think it's the, it's the, it's the mental aspect of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, on the sick side of that continuum, it's the victim mindset. Um, if we were to kind of go up a little bit, you fall into the way that a pessimist would think up in the middle, quote, well, where most people aspire to be would be the optimist. Uh, we certainly don't aspire for wellness. We aspire for fitness. Fitness is a hedge against sickness. If you are well and something catastrophic happens, you are now sick. If you are fit and something catastrophic happens, you have to pass through wellness before you are sick. So this is why we want to be not just an optimist, but we'd like to be past that. And the next area phase that we'd like to edge into is the realist. I think that some of us have probably touched at certain parts, um, experienced that final side, which is the competitor mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, before we kind of like just give some examples of those, I actually don't even like the term mindset for the same reason. It's not set. Like this Mm -hmm. is, it's, it's, I really think that the better way to think about this is when things don't line up for you. When things don't happen the way you want them to happen, what's that voice in your head saying? Yep. That's really what this comes down to. And there are other things, right? You're like your ability to focus, like there's other stuff. But to me, that's really what it comes down to. If you're if you're saying the right things, you're able to focus. Because flow follows focus. The opposite side of focus is a fragmented state. So there is this other alpha, beta, and gamma brain waves. There is some science we can dive into, but without going there and just pulling back, keeping it at this more um, accessible and fun conversation level, What when it doesn't line up, what are you saying? That's Everyone can identify with that. So mm-hmm. one of the more poignant ways to exemplify this would be a story. You know, and I think a lot of people have experienced something similar to this, which is you know, you get on a flight and it's a six hour flight, whatever it might be, and you're excited to fill in the blank, sleep, watch movies, do work, read books, whatever it might be. And as you're settling into your seat, there's the two seats next to you that are open and you're like, oh yeah, this is a good, this is gonna be good. And then lo and behold, uh, a young mom with a toddler, you know, a baby, an infant sits down next to you. And, you know, a few minutes into the flight on takeoff, the baby starts just like wailing and crying, like really just like belting it out. Okay. When that happens and the baby has been crying for five, 10, 20 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, this is the time what's going through your head. The victim says, of course, this would happen to me. Mm -hmm. Like I want to do some work. And of course, a baby's crying baby sitting next to me. And that's what they get off the flight. And it's what they talk about. Like, like, of course, I want to get some work. I want to sleep. I want to do this. But a baby sat next. And that's what they're talking about. The pessimist goes this, maybe a swear in there, but this sucks. 
<laughs> God, like this, like this sucks. This is terrible. I hate this. The optimist, you know, when the baby's five, 10, 15 minutes in goes, ah, the, he'll stop crying. He'll stop crying in a few minutes. He'll stop crying in a few minutes. And <laughs> the optimist lacks bracing. The optimist uh, is not in touch with reality, which is why we want to get to the next area, of, which is the realist. And when the baby starts crying, what the realist says, and this this sounds like I'm I'm this is not hyperbole or this is not exaggeration. This is the way some people operate inside their heads. I know it's not most of us. They go, Yeah, babies cry. Babies cry, and I'm taking flights, and the chances are that there's going to be a crying baby that sits next to me on one of these flights. Okay. Crying baby. There it is. Got it. That's my reality. That's what some people are able to do. And they don't create extra drama around it. And we start to realize this. It's like the Shakespeare said, there is no good or bad, but thinking makes it so. If you're a realist, it it's just this ability to radically accept the way the world is happening. That's it. And you can't change the baby crying. The best thing that you can do at that point is accept it. The optimist story tells and goes, it's okay. It's going to be okay because this or it's a, 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 like, and the, pe- the, the pessimist and the victim just storytell as well. It, another word for storytelling is creating drama, which is melodrama. It's just like you're making the situation bigger and worse than it is. So that's the first four phases, but there's a fifth, which is that competitor mindset. And that competitor, and again, I know this isn't what most the way most people think, but there are people that think this way. The competitor goes, well, this is going to be a challenge. Mm-hmm. Good. It's the Jocko thing, right? It's the, yep. you know, you got tapped out. You didn't get the job you wanted. You got fired. Yeah, um, you got injured. Good. Like something you're gonna you're gonna grow and evolve from this. Like you don't grow and evolve without challenges. This is a challenge. So now that this is happening, can you turn inward? This is what happens. Victim, pessimist, optimist, looking outward. Something out there is good or bad. Realist neutral competitor turns inward and goes, how can I use this opportunity to grow? And that's it. That's Mm -hmm. a, that's what these different phases represent. Can we level up? Can we reframe things? Can we use some tools and tactics to try to spend more time being a realist and maybe edging into being a competitor than we can in the lower ones? I don't want to say being an optimist is bad. It's certainly a whole lot better than being a pessimist. That's well. That's a um, resting heart rate of 75. That is mm-hmm. running an eight-minute mile. That's being able to do a pull-up. That is um, a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Like that's just – you're just mm-hmm. – no one's bugging you either which way. <laughs> but yep. if you start to get the other ones, people go like, whoa, check that guy out. That's mm-hmm. some interesting stuff. That's that guy can run a five minute mile, deadlift five hundred pounds, do thirty pull ups, and has a resting heart rate of forty two. Whoa, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Other end of the spectrum, you can't deadlift an empty barbell because you can't reach down and grab it. Your resting heart rate is ninety four, and your body fat's thirty six percent. And we all know this, like. We all know what living life like those different parts is. Remember, fitness is a hedge against sickness. The more time we can spend being a realist or a competitor, the less time we'll spend being, quote, mentally unfit. This is mental fitness. Mm. It's funny you said that because I've heard Simon Sinek, it's similar to what you had said before, like mindset is not the right word, but I've heard him talk around this or about this, not not these five things, but... 
And he, he was really pushing on the idea that it's mental fitness in the same way that it is fitness. It's it's physical fitness. It's not something that is done. It is something that we are doing. And some days we're stronger than others. And some days we crush PRs and some days we just don't even come close. Right. And so I do like that as the reframe. It's, it's mental fitness in the same way that we think about physical fitness. We call it Um, mental health, right? We call it mental health, but yeah, and we don't create the, the framework and we say we're just, we are just necessarily by default. Imagine if no one ever took control of what they ate, how they slept or the way they exercised. And there was like, I just have the health that I have. Yep. Well, this whole thing, you don't just get to run five minute miles, dead five, dead 500 pounds, um, and have that level of fitness. You have to work at it. This is, Mm -hmm. it's work to get there. And just like it would take work to get to those performance, physical performance metrics, it would take years and years and years, probably better measured in decades. It's the same thing for this. Now, people certainly have a head start, just like they do physically. If you write, grow up in the right environment, exposed to the right stimulus, you have a better mm-hmm. chance of physical health and mental health. Now, some people have experienced physical trauma, and some people have experienced mm-hmm. mental trauma. And it's important to just kind of um, put an asterisk next to that victim one, because this is the victim mindset. It's not be. It's not a victim. There mm-hmm. are victims, unfortunately, by no fault of their own, that have been um, the victim of tragedy and terrible things. But there are people that have experienced those things that don't act like victims. Mm-hmm. And if we're still holding on to things decades later that happened earlier, that's the mindset that we need to work on. You when you're talking about the realist, something popped into my head, which is from and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get the the exact words right, but from Oliver Berkman's Four Thousand Weeks, he was talking about somebody, and he I don't think he used the word guru, but like this kind of like enlightened individual, and he was saying that he was in the audience for a, a talk that this person gave, and he and and the guy kind of leaned into the microphone and he said, "You want to know the secret?" And everybody was like, yeah, tell us the secret. Like, we want to know what you know. We want to feel like you feel. And he said, and the guy said, I just don't mind what happens next. Mm. <laughs> Which I love. I love that idea. Just even just just mind less what happens next. And you will find that you are in, you are moving into that space of being a realist. To your point, kid sits down, starts crying. Just don't mind what happens next. Or just mind a little bit less. Um, I just think that pops that popped in my head. I loved I I loved that part of uh, that bit in the book. Um, I want to talk to you about default states here because I feel like that's where it makes sense to to really think about these things. And we actually got a question uh, separate of us uh, preparing for this conversation. It just happened to come in, uh, and I made a note and I flagged it. It's from Diego. He said, I've noticed that for most of my day, I fall into the victim mindset. What's scary is that it seems to be my strong default mindset. When I'm working, traveling, or just resting, my mind always flows through complaints, sadness, and bad thoughts about my future. Even when I have a good time, this victim mindset grabs me. For example, when I'm uh, with my girlfriend, I think about the sadness of being lonely, or when I work out, I think about when I was fat years ago. The problem in my question for you is, do you have any suggestions for a person uh, who does not want, who wants to escape the victim mindset, but this mindset is so damn strong that it comes automatically multiple times during the day? So that's my question uh, to you and for us is... How do we first recognize what our default is? And maybe some of us, our default is op- like, I know people whose default is optimism or even realism, right? And I just, just as like Diego, I know people whose default are, are victim or pessimist. So is, is that step one is to just kind of place ourselves, not know, because to your point, like we could be all five of these within five minutes, but it's like when things settle back down, where do we settle? That feels to me like an important thing to figure out before any of the the work needs to be done to improve our mental fitness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> chasing excellence talk. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I do believe that people have a natural, just kind of the same way people have with, with medical community, the medical community would say is a set, like a uh, set yeah. point for their weight. Set point. Yeah. 
Uh, and I've heard set point for happiness too, which is related. I, I believe it. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it has mostly to do with, uh, I shouldn't say mostly, I think it has to do equally with nature and nurture. I think mm-hmm. anyone that's had more than one child can just like see the stark differences even at like for like infant, infant, infants in disposition. Yep. Like with no, with seemingly nothing that you've done drastically different from anything, two kids will have very, very different set points. And I think that's um I, I think that's a big part of it. I think the next part is that I think the environments, we are shaped by our environments. So if you are around um seemingly positive, happy, optimistic people, the chances of you coming out of that really negative victim pessimistic mindset are a lot less likely than you would be with a positive disposition and vice versa from moving from that is there a set point to diego's um situation i would Mm -hmm. say that he probably has a default mindset but i would not classify that as a victim mindset. I think that we've talked about this before in terms of like the way Brene Brown does talks about this, which is um, people just have a hard time labeling emotions. And um, he's just throwing out sad. Like I'm just, Mm -hmm. and and I don't think it's wrong. It sounds like he's sad, but Mm -hmm. because you're sad doesn't necessarily mean that you're a victim. If anything, it sounds more like a pessimist than anything else. Um, but I think vic- victim needs a, something pointed at, like we need to point something to be the victim. It needs to be not no. us. It needs to be something else. Right. It's not us. And it's kind of like the woe is me. Like, why is this mm-hmm. happening to me? And <clears throat> the pessimist is more like, well, this just, this is negative. This sucks. I don't like this. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's really interesting is when he thinks of positive things or is exposed to positive things, he diverts back to the flip. And I, what I would call this is the beginning of working on yourself. If you're not aware of this, um, you can just kind of live there. But once you become aware of it, it's hard work. And a lot of times when you try to be grateful for things and you're exposed to um, beauty, um, joy, um, things that you otherwise should be uh, appreciative of, you can um, really quickly flip to the other side and go, but there's so much hurt in the world. Um, I could so quickly lose this. Um, There's, yeah, I have this great thing. Why do I deserve it? And this is just the level of understanding things outside of yourself. And, you know, we just talked about it a little bit before we talked about Diego. We talked about how this is a a decades long journey. And Mm -hmm. if he, if we're just edging into this, this understanding of this framework, and we're just giving language to, oh my, and understanding to, oh my gosh, I, I think my default is the victim and I'm starting to recognize when this pops up and it pops up in these weird times as well. Whoa, that's kind of, that's kind of amazing. That's kind of, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a next level. It's kind of like you start to, you're playing a game of cards and you start to understand the rules of the game instead of just holding a deck of cards in your hand and staring at them and having no idea what to do with these things. Now you go, oh, I see that I have this run and this flush and these pairs and I don't really know the, how to do the strategy part of this, how to make it better, but I understand what I'm holding here. I think that's where Diego is. It's just... um mm-hmm. You know, there's certainly a whole bunch of tools that we could use from when you feel these things, you know, there's upregulate and downregulate. There's um, using perspective. There's um, um, seeing yourself on a spectrum. There's, There's a bunch of different things that we can do. One is the awareness. That gives you 
so much. That gives you, you, you realize that you're playing a game that like, holy smokes. And then from there, there's tactics and strategies. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we can just start to like play on those tactics and strategies. You know, the simplest one is reframing things. You know, it's just, you know, when, when you, uh, the bit crying baby is next to you on the pl- plane or Diego is spending time with his girlfriend and he feels joy, but that immediately flips to, wow, I could feel so lonely. It's just trying to work it back. And it's not going to work back right now. But yeah, you can't deadlift 300 pounds right now, but you're still going to go to the gym and try. That's mm-hmm. it's practice. And we just talked. It takes mm-hmm. years and years or decades and it's fitness. It doesn't just happen. You have a default state based off of who knows why. I certainly don't. Based off of the nature and nurture of your past, um, genes and environment for why you're in this default state. And if we want to grow out of it, which I hope that he does, and it sounds like he does, yep, it's going to take work. And mm-hmm. um, the work is, this is what I was saying, is the beginning of this process, it's uncomfortable. It's painful. It's because uh, you don't just kind of like live in this default state where you go, because here's the danger of the victim. The victim is there. The reason they are that is because that gives them a sense of control and empowerment. Mm-hmm. I get to mm-hmm. label me as this person. And in a weird way, it's the hero's journey in reverse where th- there's a lot of movies about victims, right? And I, look at me like, oh my gosh, like all this is happening to me. And that's, uh, that is their way of assigning importance to themselves. It's all ego driven until you can pop yourself out and go, it's, it's not that it's just like, mm-hmm. but doesn't the baseline message here is it doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen without work and work is hard and it's uncomfortable. And that's, that's how we move, uh, to a new default and you can. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Uh, quick story. And then I'll follow up with a question. <clears throat> Uh, even though we started this conversation saying it's a beautiful spring day here in the Northeast, somehow four or five days ago, we got a bunch of snow. I don't know if we got a bunch of snow there, but we got a ton of snow and we lost electricity on Thursday morning at about 5 a.m. And it came back Saturday night at about 5 p.m. And so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, <clears throat> my wife and I were basically like trying to figure out because the kids had no school because of course they can't go to school. It's nothing. So we're trying to figure out how to get some work done, where to find some heat, all these things. And on Saturday, I I'd, I'd snuck away to go to the book, go to a bookstore and just get, get a couple hours of work done. Um, and my wife texted me because she got a note from the power company saying, we think the power will be back on on Tuesday. So this was Saturday afternoon at about like three or four. We had been through three days of no power and all the other things. And in that moment, I knew that we were having this conversation soon. So that's probably playing, it played a part of it. But in that moment, I was like, okay, it would be very easy to feel very bad for myself. Because listen, listen, a couple of days without electricity, not like not the biggest deal, but in the moment it feels like terrible. <laughs> it's yep. a giant pain in the ass. I was days behind on work, all the other things that can run through your mind. But I was sitting there in the bookstore and I was like, nope, not going to go there. And so I packed up my stuff and I was just like, by the time I get home, I'm going to have a plan for what we're going to do until Tuesday. My, my goal being, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I got to competitor, but I got to realist. And I said, by the time I get home, I'm going to have a plan for what we're going to do so that we can get through this. And so that Michelle's not stressed out anymore, et cetera. Now the whole thing didn't matter because by the time I got home, the electricity came back on. So like, I didn't really have to implement the plan, but my point is having recognizing, and this gets to my, my question or my next point, recognizing how easy it is to settle back into either victim mindset or pessimist and recognizing that I have to burn mental matchsticks to use a phrase that you used before that I love. I have to burn mental calories to get beyond or past or away from these two lower stages of the continuum. Recognizing that I, this is not going to happen automatically. Again, I know people who would probably would. It might happen automatically for you. Awesome. For me, it's easy to settle into victim or pessimist. And so I had to work out myself out of it. And that's my, that's again, my point or my question, which is like moving the continuum is the same thing as moving the continuum of health, of, of sickness, wellness, fitness in the sense of 
it requires more and more energy to go from one side to the other. And we are built to conserve energy. We are built mm -hmm. to not expend energy because a thousand, seven, a million years ago, we had no idea when we were going to eat again. And I'm not running after that thing unless I know this food at the end of it or th that I'll be alive at the end of it, right? And so I think that's such a big part of it, which is we have to teach ourselves to burn mental, ma mental matchsticks in pursuit of optimism, in pursuit of realism, and certainly in pursuit of being that competitor. That's amazing. Yeah. That's uh it it takes work. It takes mental match sticks. You gotta you gotta go for it. And again, some people lucky enough to be um an optimist and they have a little bit of work to get to a realist, you know. Um others, default victim, it's gonna be a lot of work just to get to become an optimist. You know, that's that's really the case. And it's your example is such a sweet microcosm of there's there's like this this journey that people, I, I would love to li label it something because um, mm. we all experience it with like COVID, right? Mm. You, it's just like a little mini COVID that you just experienced, which is, yeah. yep. you know, and that's another really awesome example that people can kind of all go through and kind of like, oh, I remember what I was saying and thinking and feeling, you know, are you the kind of person that when COVID hits and you have a... Um, a trip planned with your buddies to Nashville, you go, oh, of course this thing hits and it cancels my trip. Like, it, like it's <laughs> it's not about you. This is not about you. Yep. Or are you the per type or is it more like, oh, don't guys, don't worry. This will be, this can be fun. It'll be easy. We'll be over in two weeks. Remember those conversations? It'll be over in two weeks and you totally, the, the challenge with an optimist and this is, I, I'm default optimist mm -hmm. and I've recognized it and um, yeah, I recognize it because now one of our business partners is a bigger optimist than I am. And, <laughs> oh, and it, it, it's hard because mm. you, they don't recognize the issues at hand. Like if you were to come home and be like, till Tuesday, we're fine. Don't worry about it. It's right. going to be awesome. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> Candle then, lights everywhere. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, you have no food. <laughs> You got, you got no food. You got no yeah. money. Our pets' heads are falling off. You know? So you have to, the, the realist understands that there's going to be, there's going to be things that you like and things that you don't like. It's just part of life. Like that's a part of life. And what happens is the realist can navigate life better. That's what happens. You become more productive because walking down a hallway, the most productive way is to walk down the middle of the hallway. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more painful and slower to smash into sides to side to side and smash into the walls as you make your way down. If you're not a realist, that's what you're doing. You're just telling stories and creating extra drama and extra things. And you're said another way, you're not staying centered. Mm -hmm. The realist is centered. Now the competitor gets excited about the walk down the path, especially when the hallway might start shaking. It's like, ah, yeah, this is what's going to, this is what's going to make me better. So the, that's the best way because the, the competitor understands truly what this whole thing might be about, which is becoming the best versions of ourselves, living life to the fullest, embracing challenges and adversity, because those are the things that make us grow, which set up the next generation for something even better, you know, than AKA evolution and the whole shebang. But, mm -hmm. um, we can use not only your example of the power, but every little thing. Remember the way we started this off. What does the voice inside your head say when things don't go the way that you want them to? And the really cool thing is to recognize the tiny little things when these are mm -hmm. tiny, because that's when you start, when you recognize them and they're tiny and you start to try to like, Ooh, can I just get to the optimist? Ooh, can I get to the realist? Can I edge into the compet? Like when you work on the little ones, we're working with little dumbbells, like little weights. Mm -hmm. We're getting like a little bit fitter. And we all know, like if someone throws a 600 pound bar on, you know, on your back, I'm going to get smushed. Well, mm -hmm. that's the really big things. That's my kid getting sick. Like, like mm -hmm. diagnosed with a horrific disease. Like I'm not, 
set up to be the real asserting competitor in that scenario. Maybe I could try to pretend to be an optimist a little bit, but I know I'm going to fall into victim and because it's too heavy for me. That's just too heavy. But if I don't do the work on the little ones, I'm never going to be held to handle the medium ones. Yep. If I can't handle the medium ones, I'll never be able to handle the big ones. And this is what we want to be able to do is just handle hard better. Yep. Uh, I think I've got <clears throat> two more questions uh, that I want to hit on before we, before we wrap this up. Uh, but first, the, the, I think the first one will be, because you just sort of alluded to it a little bit. We we used to talk about this in iterations past as the the kind of the pinnacle was there was a point where it was, you would call it the curious competitor, and then it evolved into the warrior mindset. And now it's kind of back to the competitor. Can you just speak yeah. a little bit to your own thinking just in playing with these ideas, having them in your head for more than, you know, more than a day? Why have we landed where we did? Well, I'll talk through the whole uh, iterative process, which is sure. Um, the curious competitor really, res that's what it is. I want to be curious and I want to go and like find challenges, not competitor in the sense of I want to win. And little Johnny's so upset after little league when he loses. And um, it's not that it's, I want, I want to go up against stimulus, whatever that is, that challenges me. That's what competitor is. And the curious one, the curious part of that is like, it's just that like with levels of curiosity, like I wonder how this is going to turn out, not with judgment. So the whole idea was anything below that, certainly below are the real layers in judgment. So curiosity is the opposite of judgment in my, in my estimation. I moved to warrior because it sounded really soft. I, I didn't like the sound because, of the curious competitor. Yeah. And I, I, I wasn't yet ready to stay a competitor. Um, and when I started, because I also started using the analogy of the the true warrior, the samurai warrior that now dominates the dojo and roams the earth looking for a worthy foe, because he knows that that's the only way he can grow and evolve and become better. So warrior made a lot of sense to me. And that's why we started to edge that way. But I really do come back to, um, I think it's, I, I just need to do a better job of explaining what a true competitor is. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I like that responsibility in this setting of not going, it needs to be a warrior because warriors are also, uh, potentially violent, you know, and it's not mm -hmm. about that. And I really think that, uh, people misunderstand the word competitor and, I think through this framework and this continuum, this is the right place to have that conversation and say, this is the pinnacle of mental fitness is to have a competitive mindset. Again, mm -hmm. not, I, it's not about, it's not, I, I, what do you like or hate more winning or lose? It's not that thing. It's also not, I don't want to win. You certainly mm -hmm. want to win. Like you really, really want to win. But more important is your growth and development. That's what it is. So you're okay with losing to someone better than you as long as it made you better in the process. That's different than the way most people today define competitor. Most people today define competitor as the opposite, which is um, win at all costs, win or nothing, win is everything. That's not what we're saying. We're saying choose the competitive mindset because it is the one that has is the most um, likely to help you become the best version of yourself. The book, The Inner Game of Tennis, I think it's Tim mm -hmm. Galloway. He has this really cool, he explains this real struggle he had with his own kind of journey of trying to be a professional tennis player to being a professional uh, professional tennis coach. And where competition sat with him and all this. And he has this really cool, I think his dad explained it to him in this way, which is um, a surfer. And I think we've talked about this on the uh, here before, mm -hmm. but um, in the, even something as non-competitive as surfing and surfing is just you and the wave, man. It's just, it's the most soulful thing there is. It's, you know, Jack Johnson, bro. Um but 
what this, what surfers don't do is go paddle out and just jump on the first wave they see. They get a whole lot more surfing than if they did. But if you ever watch surfers, they paddle out there and sometimes they're out there for like 15 minutes just, you know, sitting on their boards. And what they're doing is they're waiting for a wave that will challenge them. That's it. That's the whole idea is the bigger the wave and obviously at the right threshold, right? The the right wave at the yeah. right level of that's going to challenge. That's That's the competitive nature of that. I want the challenge. I want the harder wave. I don't want to take the first three footer that rolls by. I'm going to wait for the the big one because mm-hmm. that's where I know I'm going to get pushed. That's where I know I'm going to grow. That's where I know I'm going to find that sweet spot. Take that last question. Uh, thinking about Diego, thinking about everybody else out there who uh, want to take something away from this that is actionable and say, what can I start doing now that maybe I recognize, oh, I default to victim, I default to pessimism, even I default to optimism. <clears throat> Any tools, tricks, tactics that you found useful and meaningful to uh, begin in the same way that, you know, okay, we'll get to the gym, do some high intensity <laughs> exercise, right? Do some thrusters, do some pull-ups. What are the, what's the version of that for folks who are recognizing metaphorically that they need to get off the couch and off the carbs? The answer is the same tool, tactic, process, whatever you want to call it, that you used when you recognized that um, when you got the notice that you're going to be in the dark for three more days, Yep. which is, oh, I feel my mind doing that thing. It sounds too simplistic to be a useful tactic, but it is just that. I mm-hmm. recognize where I am and the gap between where I am and where I could be. I'm going to try and close the gap. Yep. That's it. Yeah. And I found it really, really helpful. And we can wrap it up here. But I find I found it really, really helpful to have the labels to be able to say, oh, I'm here. I want to be there. And for whatever reason, having the labels, having the the definition of each one of those labels makes it so much more tangible as you start thinking about, oh, I've I've got a something's got to change here, to have like a a, a mental target in your head that you can aim for is to me has been a real unlock is to just have the words. Yeah, it's it's um, we are just the sum of our habits. We're just the sum of the way we behave, and we have this. We should have this certain value set of the life we want to live, and I think most of us want to live a life that we're not being rattled by outside circumstances every play, every time we turn around a corner. But we want to have some control over our lives and have some levels of emotional maturity and be able to handle hard things. So it's a matter of when those things pop up being aware of where we actually are and the gap between that and the life we're envisioning for ourselves. It's the same thing. It's really the same conversation with somebody that's trying to be healthier. Like, Mm -hmm. do you, do you understand what you're eating? Right. Do you understand what you're actually eating and what good health looks like when you're eating? And we try to close the gap. And sometimes it can be when you're at, the birthday party and people are passing the cake and it goes, you are a person and you have to hold every single piece before it goes to the person next to you. <laughs> and they go, and Ben, do you want a big piece or a small piece? That's when it's really hard. Yeah, It's it's a lot easier when you're not hungry, when you're not around food, but this is the moment you got to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. Just like you need to be aware now, this is the time to make those decisions. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you. That was super fun. Uh, We're going to be back with a new quick shout out and then a cool down momentarily. But first, a quick word of thanks from a sponsor. We're brought to you this week by Momentus. Are you still struggling with poor sleep that's affecting your overall health and quality of life? You are not alone. Alongside building better nighttime routines and setting up your bedroom to be as conducive to deep sleep as possible, Momentus is here to help you make sure you're getting as much high quality Z's as possible. Head to livemomentous.com, use the code excellence for a 20% off discount of their sleep pack. 
What is it? It's a powerful blend of magnesium, L-threonate, apigenin, and L-theanine that's designed to help you fall asleep faster or stay asleep longer and wake up fully recharged. Each ingredient in Momentous Sleep plays a crucial role. Magnesium L-threonate delivers calm to your brain. Apigenin helps you enter a more restful state, and L-theanine stimulates relaxation. Best of all, Momentous Sleep is free of banned substances, toxic elements, and fillers, so you can rest easy knowing that what you see on the label is exactly what you've got. It's time to get serious about your sleep. Visit livemomentous.com now. Use the code excellence for a 20% off discount on sleep and all of their top of the line products. Remember, good sleep is fundamental to our health span and lifespan. Do not compromise on it. Take control of your sleep with Momentous Sleep. Livemomentous.com. Use the code excellence for 20% off. Your body and mind will thank you. Okay, a shout out real quick. It's a short shout out which is good because we're running a bit longer than usual. This is from Chris. I mentioned it before, but when folks sign up for the premium membership, there's a little space to send us a little note, which has been great. This is from Chris uh, after he signed up for the premium membership. I've, uh, I've listened to the Chasing Excellence podcast from episode number one. At that time, I was single. I am now married with two daughters. Ben and Patrick have mentored me through these life changes. and I am better person, husband, father because of their investment in this community. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I was also Chris. not married and had no kids when we started this podcast. <laughs> that's so amazing. We're in the same boat. <laughs> that's, that's wild. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's funny to wow. think about. <clears throat> All right. Uh, cool down. Hopper talk is when I grab a question from the internets uh, to have a little bit of fun as we wrap up episodes. I got this one, as I often do, Ask Reddit. Uh, what were you really into when you were a kid? And I said this at the top. I... I would get, I have, other than skiing, I can't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to guess for you. So I'm super curious what you were really into. And I don't know what kid, like, I don't know, pick your own age. Like it could be three to seven to 14. I don't care. Uh, okay. Um, this might sound obscure, but maybe not. I don't know. When I grew up, we had a stream in my backyard, like a brook Mm -hmm. and the amount of time that I spent in that stream is wild. It was like hmm. Huckleberry Finn type thing <laughs> where I would, and I love streams to this date, I think because of that, yep. but from, I would dam it up. I would revert it. I would make it go a different direction. I would okay. walk through like, I would follow it through people's backyards into like marshes and woods and swing on vines and take it down like a little waterfalls and I would, I would be this maybe like um very uh engineer slash adventurous like from the actual constructing it in a certain way there was one of one of the highlights was one day two fish came down the stream and we're like we dammed up the stream in the front of it and behind it and i would yep. put like pvc i would make pvc pipes that would the push the water through and um, we also had a tree house and, and, uh, right next to the stream. So I thought that I, I had this like envision of creating a, like this gang that would roam up and down the streams and our tree house would be our fort. And yeah. I would have this gang and I would always try to recruit neighborhood kids to be in my gang. And the gang was yep. the only purpose of the gang was to prepare to defend ourselves against other gangs. And I grew up in like Wellesley, Massachusetts. It's like, there's no gangs at there's all. There's no gangs there. No, yep. it, but it was like, it wasn't about gang gangs. It was more like, you know, now I think uh, it was like teams, but it was really more like end of the world stuff. It was like okay. when the Back wor- to the apocalypse. For yeah, you. <laughs> it was basically that. I didn't know it was that. I didn't think of it that way, but I was like, hey, if shit goes down, we're going to be ready. Because we have these handmade spears and it was like Lord yep. of the Rings type stuff. And we've got these like we, – we know how to navigate the stream. And so I was like really, really into that stream. Like <laughs> – Amazing. Yeah. And you built a little, you built a little, it's not a stream, but you oh, built yeah, a little right. water thing. I, for, I have a water feature in my backyard right? now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I nice. really like that. All right, I got, really, I've got yeah. some questions, but I'll, I'll give, I'll give my answer first just so we can put it on the table, which is when I was re, when I was young, you know, in the, you know, kind of where my, my son is now like seven to 10, I, I basically, and I don't know if this is hyperbole or if this is just something 
or, or that if this was even close to being true. But like my mother would tell me that I basically read like every book in the kids section of the town library. Oh my God. Um, and so, which is probably not a surprise to anybody who knows me. Um, so that was the like storytelling and writing and, and, and reading uh, was a really big part of my life when I was really young. And then as I moved into high school and even before high school, but moving into high school, I got really into sports. And when I was thinking about this question, the thing that like, if like, what were you really into as a kid? When I think about high school, I had a, I had like a study period for some reason in high school in the first couple of years. And they would let me go to the library. I don't like, I just had a free period. I could go to the library. I have no idea why I had a free period, but I would go to the library and they had newspapers there and I would take like the Boston globe down and the New York times and whatever else they had there. And in a notebook, I would write like, uh, box scores of basketball games and like stats from various players. And I have no idea what I did with it. I have no idea why or what I thought I was going to do with it, but I would spend like hours a week, like transcribing stats and facts from wow. various basketball players and baseball players. So do you have, do you have an inkling of what that motive might've been? Like what the why behind that was? I like, I don't, I, I, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know what, again, I don't know what I thought it was leading towards other than it was just really interesting to me. Wow. Um, and, uh, so it had something to do with sports. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Like I wish I could, I, I what I really wish that I had like those notebooks to see what the heck I was actually doing with them, but alas, uh, gone with time. But here's my question to you. And it's the thing I was thinking about with this question. And I'm even with your answer now, I'm curious what, I, I don't know. Like, can you draw a connection to what you were really into as a kid playing in the stream, building your gang <laughs> with what ultimately you are as an adult really into today. Like, can you draw parallels there? Even if they're, they're loose ones. I don't think it's loose at all. I want to create a family. <laughs> of, I want to create a tribe of like ridiculously fit, prepared people. Yeah. That's isn't that like, interesting? No, it's yeah. exactly. I mean, it is like it. Um, it is a weird thing that this is what I ended up doing. And obviously we're not, I'm not teaching people how to whittle sticks to have pointy ends no, or yeah. how to, or how to re redirect streams. But the idea behind that was like, let's create a, a, a group of people that's prepared for when something happens. And this is not like the apocalyptic thing, but it is the um, handle hard, better thing. It's like when mm -hmm. the hard thing comes, we're going to be ready. So, so interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it's it's wild because this wasn't a linear path to get to here. It's not like I went right. from that to like the military even would make sense, right? Um, yep. So then, like from there into um, coaching would make sense. I didn't do any of that. I went a very very different route, but ended up back here. Yeah, and so that's my that's my second question which is now that you and I are in a position where we've got kids and we're starting to see what they get really mm -hmm. into. Do you like, how do you think about that? Like, cause your kids are a little bit older than mine. So mine are just beginning to develop like uh, what I would consider like, Oh, you're really into that kind of thing. And you're really into that kind of thing with kids a little bit older. And obviously you've got the, old, the, the bigger kids too. Do you, do you notice what they're really into? And do you like, do you think about, Oh, like, Oh, you might be an engineer or you might re yeah. be really into, whatever the heck it might end up being. Uh, I'm just curious because you're, you're a little bit ahead of me on that. I, th I think it'd be hard not to, I think everyone kind of yeah. projects like that. It's like, um, first off, so just appeal. We have two older kids, uh, with 23 year old and a 19 year old. And then we have the younger kids, which are 11 and nine and then 11 and nine year old. So I've been through it with the first ones. Mm -hmm. Obviously they're not, um, their career path isn't set. But with a, yeah, I think everyone goes, oh, you're, you're going to be, because mm -hmm. Bodhi's very analytical. He's like, you're going to be an engineer or uh, you're going to be a professional skier or you're going to, at Harley, you're going to be a performer or, you know, it's like, um, well, Harley, it's, uh, she tells us every day what she's going to be anyway. So it's like, <laughs> and so when I, every day or uh, the same when, thing? When I grow up, I'm going to have, no, it's like, it's the same five things. I'm going to be a veterinarian that has a bakery, um, a CrossFit games athlete and, uh, a songwriter. So it's like, <laughs> so it's like, Amazing. uh, but it's, uh, and then of course you go, yeah, I also, it's this weird thing where you want to provide opportunities and, and mm -hmm. direction and lead and encourage, 
but you also want them to carve their own path. And just like I said, my path wasn't linear and I feel like I ended up right where I should be. So I, I take very much, and you know this from working with me, but I'm a very hands-off um, mm-hmm. in terms of, I would call it like uh, pushing or molding passions. I, I, let it, mm-hmm. I let it happen. I'm not very – the only rule that we have is if you start something, you can't stop it in the same – whatever it is, yep. year or season. season. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, yep. com- you committed to this team. You're doing this through. And uh, we made that mistake with uh, Jonah – Maya, there was no stopping her at all. She was Maya was right. <laughs> full speed, and we made that mistake with Jonah. I won't say it's a mistake because Jonah's awesome, um, but I do think that commitment matters. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, I I'm not one to say like um, you started karate and now you have to stay through it until you're a black belt. You know, if they want to change, then uh, we let them change. Amazing. All right, we're going to wrap it up there because we're a bit longer than usual. Thank you, everybody out there, for listening. One more time, if you want to get a question into a future episode, www.chasingexcellence.email is the best way to do so. We thank you in advance. We love your questions. Keep them coming. Uh, Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Thank you for sharing the show with your friends. This would be a wonderful episode to share with some friends who perhaps are not on the Chasing Excellence train. This is a really good kind of deep dive into what we often talk about here. So we thank you in advance for that as well. Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence.